mad elephant is is such a presence in the landscape so that um, when you get the chance to visit, you can see this is the front gate. It takes an hour to walk up the mount, around the circuit and back again and it's truly exhilarating. When you're up there, you can see, you can be seen for 60 kilometres, you can see that far. You can see the Grampians on a good day. You can see across to Mount Buninyong. Mount Buninyong and Mount Elephant appear in one of the Aboriginal dreaming Dreamtime stories, and once a year we have uh, the Mount Buninyong Middle School visit the mount, and they bring some Indigenous elders with them, and they revisit the story of the battle between Mount Elephant and Mount Buninyong, which um, accounts for that dint in the top where they where they had a fight. So that it was part of <coughs> Aboriginal history when Indigenous people um, were the, the um, only people there. It was certainly part of early settlement history. It was called the Swagman's Lighthouse. You could use it to orientate yourself wherever you were. Um, nearly everyone in the district has a little bit of Mount Elephant in their driveway when mining was fashionable. And you can see that quarry on the north face and there's a much larger quarry on the, uh, on the, the far side, which in maybe for the last 20 years has been closed but before that it was being actively mined. It also was, those trees you can see were planted. Um, the last trees probably went in, uh, the, uh, 44 bushfires took a lot. Before that they'd been harvested uh, for a dairy factory and um, it was also grazed. So it's always been contributing to the community in various ways, but now it really is part of your your waking life. You see it all the time at sunset and sunrise, maybe sunset, and um, wherever you look, it frames your view. And when you meet people who are travelling through, there was one woman who visited, and she had a story quite a lot older than I am, and she said when she was a child, her mother used to cut her breakfast up and slice her toast into triangles, and they all had names, Mount Pompanee, Mount Lura, Mount Elephant, and now that the mount is open, she said she never thought she'd get to, to visit it. And so all the time you have this most extraordinary experience, now that it's open, of meeting people who feel they have some association with the mount. When in um, the year 2000, a community group was formed which combined the two nearby towns, which are both towns of about 350 people on the Hamilton Highway and we're two hours west of Melbourne. These towns have the right amount of cooperation and competition and this little community group, Derenal Lismore Community Association, decided to have a concert on the Mount um, calling Music on the Mount and that was a great success. We've always had good access to the Mount from the private landholders who've owned it but this was a, a big community event and we had a lot of outside visitors and a lot of local people and raised money for a charity. At the end of the year 2000, the local owner, who was the person who mined at the Elbridges, uh, put it on the market and put it up for auction. So the community had always sort of felt it half owned the mount, even though it didn't because it was part of its view and, it, um, and they had good access. And thought they'd like to buy it, but didn't know quite what they'd used, use it for. And there were a whole lot of really wild ideas that came out, like, how about a scoria ski slope? And um, <laughs> one was cementing the middle and making a lake. Um, when the opportunity came up to work for, with Trust for Nature, we were, the Trust for Nature link came apart about because one of the board members of Trust for Nature had a property adjoining the mount. So this proposal came up, working for Trust for Nature. So all of the all of the odd ideas vanished immediately. Oh no, one of them went ahead but not on the mount, and that was the virtual burials. They happened just a little bit further away. But a virtually unanimously the community could understand that with Trust for Nature it would be protected and you would have access. And I think that that unity of purpose 
came about because of the association with trust for nature. If the community had just bought it, I think we'd still be deciding how it was going to be used. And, um, but there's just no question. With the trust for nature purchased it, and it was $200,000, and the arrangement was the community would raise half of that money, which they did in five months. There was hardly a person who didn't contribute. And everyone felt as an equal contributor, so that we have, um, we are in quite a low socioeconomic group in the towns. I think so many people gave $5, $10, sometimes $100, and there were some large donors. But it didn't seem to matter whether you were large or small, you could contribute. So we ended up with this map that was owned, the, the title was held by Trust for Nature, the management is held by the community, and the overall purpose is quite clear. So it aligns with the community wishes and with Trust for Nature wishes. We then set about um, getting a management plan. We worked with the Shire and they funded us an entrance track, which you can see there that takes, brings you in from the, the main road. So we were setting up to involve the community. Then we, to our amazement, a, um, a local man, well he'd been born in the community in about 1921. He started working for his father in the local butcher shop at 15. He had then gone on to become a businessman and run a farm. And he was, in the year 2001, in a nursing home in Ballarat. And he decided to um, support the community that he thought had supported him <coughs> as he was growing up. And he wanted to give $500,000 to the community. And because it was so obvious the community supported this project. Everyone had donated. And because we had a local community group which had helped the fundraiser raising and it linked the two communities and it had run this project on the mount, it had credibility. So we had local credibility. We also had structural credibility. So Trust for Nature, you could see it wasn't a fly-by-night organisation, it could handle money, it could give tax deductibility. And so um, Jack Borbidge decided to donate his money to Trust for Nature so it could be used on the mount. So we ended up with a, a large amount of money in trust. And it was because I think all of those things had been put in place quite inadvertently, but the community, um, <coughs> credibility, sense of purpose, um, and they were combined with his generosity. <coughs> the other thing I think was important was at every step of the way, right from the beginning, um, there's a certain sort of flexibility that, that we've had to have and um, a certain optimism so we've had hurdles to jump over and we've managed to find people to help us hop over those hurdles. We're still on good terms with all our neighbours and that's quite hard when you're the centre of um, always controlling our rabbits and our weeds in the middle of, you know, cultured farmland. So we work very hard on doing all of those things. With this trust money that's put in place, we decided, so it came in the year, um, 2001-2, and we decided, oh, and in, in Jack's guidelines um, to the Trust on how to administer this, he was quite definite and it's quite helpful. <coughs> so he thought that it was helpful to use the money to leverage other money, which is what we try to do. He didn't want the, the money used in maintenance or administration, but in something that could be seen as substantially benefiting the community, um, or oh, what else did he have? But, but those sorts of sensible guidelines, and he wanted it for Mount Elephant, and in it there are, there are hesitant words, so it's not dogmatic what we had to do, but there are fairly firm guidelines. So we decided that um, we would run for a few years and then probably build, build something that would help people access the Mount and interpret the history of the mount and and the environment. It took a lot longer than we thought. We had a couple of false starts. We thought 
we could write, um, we got a bit of help and we thought we could write business plans and feasibility studies and things like that. We got right through a whole process and even worked out what architect we wanted, what design and went to the government and they told us that what we had done wasn't what they wanted. They actually wanted, they didn't want us to decide we wanted a visitor centre. They wanted us to employ consultants that would see if it was a reasonable thing to have a visitor centre. So we had to go back to go. Uh, it cost $40,000 to do this report. We accessed the Borbage Fund for that. We got a three for one. We got um, 30000 from the government and ten from the Borbage and um, then did a very serious feasibility study and business plan, which we're still using. With the feasibility study, there was a lot of consulting in that. And because we think it's really important to involve the community, when we put this out for tender, we said we wanted to do a lot of the consulting ourselves and we wanted training in how to consult. So we consulted with our community and our community groups. There were various groups we funded a small amount if they, can, they consulted, for example, with the schools or with the land care groups. We consulted ourselves with the other major stakeholders in the district, so the other volcanic cones and lakes in the district. We ran those consultations and we met the people and we put together what they thought. When it came to the businesses, the consultant did those and Trust for Nature, they consulted there and with the CMA and with government. So they did that level. But all the people we thought that we would want to work with again later, we organised the consultation and we are now in a position where um, when we build this, we're still in contact with these people and they will work with us on interpretation <coughs> materials and if we can encourage people to visit them, they will encourage people to visit us. So we're very pleased with keeping the community involved in that. To um, build the centre, we used, we applied for mortgage funds, we applied for $400,000 and we've had to jump through a lot of hoops to do that and rightly so. We, we wrote, um, I think I had to write it three times before I got it right, um, an application for the funding and justify it and we could justify it using our $40,000 report. We used that also to approach the state government where we got $150,000 and the Shire fifty, dollars and we're putting in twenty five. dollars So we've got quite a large project and we've got the money is, is good. It's also good to have those firm relationships and it's also good to have um, that discipline of having to get your thinking right and your application right so that you can then answer to the community and to the funding that you've done this properly. And I think to um, answer to Jack by, by being very exact in what we do. Um, at the moment, we are just laying a slab for the building, which will be at the far end of that quarry. It's on the quarry floor, so we don't disturb anything on the mount. The mount's got um, native vegetation up the top, but then quite a lot of weeds down the bottom. It will be, you can see a tiny little building at the end, that's the shed, it will be just there and it will look out over the plate. What it will do for us to start with will be um, quite a lot of families visit the mount. Often you get people who can't walk up the mount or who don't want to, elderly people. Uh, we sometimes drive them part way up, but it means that you can be a visit, visitor there with your family. You don't have to walk up, but you can sit somewhere that's good. You don't just have to sit with our one structure, Portaloo, which is just around the corner. You can sit <laughs> in dignity. You could actually go to the toilet. <coughs> At the moment, we advise people to stop in Lismore or Durham Island. So it'll be very comfortable. Um, you'll be able to learn a lot more about the environment when we have bus trips. If the weather's fine, it's wonderful. If it's not, you actually have a lot of trouble discussing environment or, or anything with with a hundred children who are all wet. So we think it'll be absolutely fantastic. We have also um, in the Borbage Fund, yet to make an application, um, Trust for NATO, if you come soon, um, 
we we had a half a million. They had they had it's actually trust for nature money, but we morally think of it as ours. But they are responsible, and they won't release it unless we have jumped through all the right hoops. So that's an interesting one there. Um, we are going to apply for some of the residual funds in the business plan. It said we should access some but leave a certain amount so that over the next five years, every year we can apply for some. And it will be for making sure the visitor centre works so that you don't just arrive to a building. We've actually um, start, we can develop interpretation materials, we can set up contacts and um, things that make sure it's used to its best ability. Because that first couple of years with the new establishment, you do have to take care to set it up properly. So um, part of that, I think that's very wise that we do that. So our task at the moment is to build the centre, uh, look to the future, invite all of you to come to visit, because in the first year we have to show that we have used this centre. We have to report at the end of 12 months, so please come. And. Um, I will make you very welcome and everyone will make you very welcome, just as I feel very welcome. Thank you.